You're late, you slowpoke wife. Upon entering my husband Scott's hospital room, his words immediately made me furrow my brows in frustration. It was just a few hours ago that the hospital had informed me of his accident. Despite leaving work early and rushing to this distant hospital, being greeted with insults was disheartening. Looking at Scott lying in the bed, both his legs were cast in plaster, indicating the severity of the accident. It was clear, even to a layman, that he wouldn't be able to walk on his own for a while. Yet, his arms were free, and he crossed them irritably. You're my wife, so it's obvious you should take care of me now that I'm in this state. Or do you dislike the idea, you heartless person? As he shouted, Scott threw a 16-ounce bottle filled with something at me from his bedside. Ouch! Before I could dodge, it struck me right on the forehead. The pain resonated throughout my head, causing me to crouch down involuntarily. Watching this, Scott clapped his hands and let out a crude laugh. Bullseye! Really, it's your fault for being so defiant. As a wife, you should quietly take care of me. While pressing against my throbbing forehead, I bit my lip. I hadn't spoken a word since entering the room. I hadn't said I wouldn't care for him, nor had I expressed any reluctance. Scott has always been someone who can't stand things not going his way, but this was the first time he resorted to verbal abuse and physical violence without even listening to me. I dreaded to think what would happen if we were alone at home, given his behavior in the hospital. My head hurt, and I felt an overwhelming urge to cry. As I was lost in thought about what to do next, suddenly, I heard the sound of someone approaching from behind. The door swung open, and as I remained crouched, something hard poked my back. I'm counting on you to take care of me, and the kids too. Turning around, there stood my sister, pushing against my back with her crutches, sporting a grin. My name is Tracy. I am a 30-year-old accountant working at a trading company. My diligent and meticulous nature suits my job well, and I am valued and relied upon at work. I have a younger sister named Lisa, who is two years my junior. Since we were children, our parents have always told me to act responsibly as the elder sister. I became the reliable older sister, leading our family, while Lisa took full advantage of my reliability. Moreover, my mother began to rely excessively on me, a diligent child, and before I knew it, I was handling all household chores and managing the family's schedules. Although I excelled academically, always ranking at the top, my dedication to household chores and studies turned me into someone who is not good at relying on others. In contrast, my pampered sister Lisa grew up to be cunning and good at winning favors. She managed to get toys from our father that I couldn't, and during Christmas gatherings, she became the center of attention among our relatives. Flattered by the attention, Lisa would then ask our parents a question. Hey, who's cuter, me or my sister? Without hesitation, our parents answered. Lisa is obviously the cuter one. Tracy is smart and diligent, but she's plain. I often felt envious and inferior, but since Lisa was also attractive and dependent on me, I couldn't help but find her endearing. As she grew older, however, her behavior became increasingly problematic. She would steal my clothes and accessories, claiming them as her own, and exchange contact information with my friends to hang out with them without me. Yet, when I thought to criticize her, she would say with a smile, give this to me. It suits me better, you think so too, right? Or your friends said they have more fun when I'm around, leaving me unable to say anything more. It's true that my sister Lisa wore my favorite clothes better and had more charm, receiving affection from others more easily. Being constantly confronted with this reality by her, I became increasingly filled with feelings of inferiority and jealousy. And because my parents also sided with her, I gradually became isolated even at home. My mother, who loved to enjoy her youth and have fun, always dressed up and went out with my father or friends, 
never providing me with any support. By the time I graduated from high school, I was treated almost like a maid. When I entered university and subsequently started working a few years later, I attended a company party meant for interdepartmental socializing, invited by a friend from work. That's where I met the man who would become my husband in the future, Scott. Scott worked in a department focused on developing new clients, was quick-witted, and always made conversations lively and enjoyable. Additionally, he was good-looking and popular both inside and outside the company. He was a bit of a show-off, but that only added to his charm. At first, I thought we were worlds apart, but to my surprise, we hit it off over our shared interests in movies and books, and quickly found common ground. After several dates, our relationship progressed to dating. Being with him, who was bright and dependable, gradually unwound the tightly wound persona I had developed from being raised as the responsible eldest daughter. He always treated me with care, making me feel valued as a woman, and as our relationship deepened, I learned to be more dependent on him. It was only by his side that I could open up. Feeling comfortable with someone was a first for me. My desire to support him, who had saved me, and to stay with him forever grew stronger each day. Then, he proposed, and we got engaged. We hardly fought while dating, and I believed we would build a happy family together. The day came for us to visit my parents. My sister Lisa was already married to a bartender named Nick, making my marriage the second in our family. Her marriage had been a whirlwind of events, including pregnancy and hurried preparations, which was still fresh in my memory. I heard she had given birth to their second child by now. They were both still young, so when I asked about them today, she said they were fine being looked after by her in-laws. My father had been living away from home due to work for several years and seldom returned. When Scott and I visited my family, not only my mother but also, unexpectedly, Lisa and her husband Nick were there, and we ended up joining them casually. My mother, who always looked younger than her age, had dressed up even more carefully today, appearing even younger than usual. Lisa, on the other hand, was dressed far too flamboyantly for a sister's marriage introduction. She must have spent a lot of time on her hair, curling it meticulously, and her makeup was elaborately done, enhancing her appearance by 50% more than usual. She wore a see-through blouse that emphasized her chest and a short skirt, which even made me unsure where to look. I wondered if her husband minded her dressing like that, but he seemed not to care. My father couldn't return home due to sudden work, so the meeting went ahead with those present. My mother and sister immediately welcomed Scott for his cheerful and pleasant demeanor. What a neat and proper person. Wow, I didn't expect my sister to snag such a handsome guy. Kind of surprising. Despite their freely spoken thoughts, the introduction went smoothly and amiably. It was fine, but my mother and sister were overly friendly with Scott, bombarding him with personal questions like, what's been the most fun experience at work, and besides my sister, who else have you dated, as if they had known him for years. Worried Scott might be uncomfortable, I was about to intervene, but he didn't seem to mind and was happily engaging in the conversation. Looking at Lisa's husband, he too was contributing to the atmosphere without any awkwardness, intertwining stories of his business trips with his hobbies. I didn't want to hear about his ex-girlfriends, especially not in a marriage meeting. Scott is so funny. I can't believe he decided to marry my overly serious sister. Lisa said something incredibly rude. That's exactly why I chose to marry her. I have a carefree side, so I fell for the dependable Tracy. That's so funny. It's a waste, Scott, you're so cool. She laughed and flaunted her cleavage at him. While I tried to hide my discomfort, my mother began praising Scott, saying things like, young men these days really are handsome, aren't they? When I first saw Scott, I thought he was a celebrity, as she flirtatiously brushed back her long hair, 
which was quite youthful for her age. Not at all. There are many more men far more handsome than me, but seemed somewhat pleased to join in the conversation. Eventually, alcohol was served, and the atmosphere turned into that of a mere drinking party, which frustrated me as I tried to steer the conversation back to wedding preparations. Somehow, because my family took a liking to him, we were able to proceed with constructive discussions about the marriage. However, the conversation often veered off topic, making it a struggle for me, Tracy, to keep everything on track until the end. After that, as we started living together and began preparing for our marriage, I found out that my mother and sister had taken a great liking to him and had exchanged contact information without me knowing. They began relying on him for various reasons, such as shopping on weekends or fixing things around the house, and each time, Scott would inform me and then head out alone. Your mother and sister are really nice people, and I enjoy their company. It's great to get along well with my fiancé's family, isn't it? He innocently mentioned this and started meeting them almost every week. He also got along well with Lisa's husband, Nick, and even started going out for drinks with him at night. Indeed, as Scott says, it's better for the relationship between my family and my fiancé to be good rather than strained. But after all, they are my family first. I can't say they should keep their distance, but the fact that they gather without me slowly creates a feeling of exclusion and discomfort. You could at least invite me if you're going. I could be useful for shopping too, and it feels lonely not to be relied upon by my own mother and sister. I brought this up lightly with him one time, and he chuckled awkwardly, dismissing my concerns. Tracy, you always seem so busy with work. You probably want to rest at home on your days off. Your mom and sister don't want to burden you, they're just being considerate. I'm a guy and I have the energy, so they call on me. Don't worry about it. He said this and patted my shoulder reassuringly. Although his explanation seemed reasonable, I felt brushed off and remained unsure whether to be satisfied with his response, continuing to harbor unresolved feelings. This situation didn't change even after we got married. Scott, who would leave work on time to the teasing of our colleagues as a newlywed, never returned directly home to live with me. Instead, he would go to see my mother and sister. By then, he didn't even bother to fabricate reasons for his visits, casually saying, I'm going to have dinner with Lisa and Diane. I'll also stop by Nick's bar, so I'll be back late, as if he was going out with friends. Diane is the name of my mother. I wonder when he started calling her by her first name. Doesn't he find it strange to frequently visit my family without his newlywed wife at home? The vague sense of alienation I felt gradually turned into irritation and anger, though I was eager to join them despite everything. At that time, my company's performance was booming, and the workload in my department was at its peak. Both my colleagues and I were stuck with daily overtime, far from being able to leave work early for leisure. During nights and weekends, all I could do was rest my exhausted body. Thus, I couldn't find the time to join my husband and my family in their gatherings. This also provided a convenient excuse for them to exclude me under the guise of being considerate of my tiredness. When I reached out to my mother and sister to ask if they had been seeing Scott recently, both confirmed they had. My mother said, Scott is so kind and thoughtful, he's really been a big help. Talking with him makes me feel younger. Lisa messaged me, saying, Scott is so smart. He has great taste in choosing places and is so fun to talk to. Honestly, he's too good for you, sis. But I'm grateful to you for introducing us to Scott. Feelings of wanting to confront both of them bubbled up, but I decided it wasn't worth starting a family feud over and chose to ignore their messages. This situation continued for several months. Until then, aside from his frequent visits to my family, Scott had been a problem-free husband. 
He helped with household chores and was always gentle when talking to me. Sometimes, as a souvenir from his meetings with my mother and sister, Scott would show his thoughtfulness by bringing home sweets. However, his behavior began to change gradually around this time. The company's performance continued to rise, leading to an increase in business trips for Scott, who works in sales. While he used to go on day trips or overnight trips about once a month, he started going on longer trips due to bigger deals. I understood that this was partly due to the company's direction and accepted it, but at the same time, Scott's attitude towards me became increasingly careless day by day. The change from before our marriage was chilling. Once, when he returned from a business trip, he glared at me as if I were an annoyance and sighed heavily as he entered the room. He carelessly threw his jacket aside and instructed me from a distance, this is dirty, so take it to the cleaners. Previously, he never did such things. When he had requests, he would talk to me face to face, and he would hand things over to me directly. Now, it was as if he was avoiding me, not even coming close. Dragging my tired body from work to do household chores, I felt miserable picking up his jacket. As I was preparing it for the cleaners, Scott's sarcastic voice echoed from afar. Accounting must be nice. No business trips or entertaining clients, just go home after work's done. No need to suck up to bosses or clients, just finish your own work and that's it. What a leisurely life. Must be nice to have so much free time. His unkind words felt like being stabbed with a knife. Sales has its hardships, and office work has its own. Before our marriage, Scott understood that. Why would he say such a thing? He seemed like a completely different person. Since you have so much free time, you could at least take care of the house properly. Look, the bathroom mirror is a bit dirty. There was also some dust in the entrance. Aren't you slacking off? Then, he started to criticize my housekeeping, something he never did before. I had prepared meals, made sure the bath was ready, and of course, did the laundry and tidied up our clothes every day. Before, Scott would help with household chores, but now, instead of helping, he nitpicked every little thing I couldn't manage to do in our daily life. I might not have business trips, so I might have more flexibility with my time, but the work I do in my department is important to the company. Saying that is disrespectful to me and to others. It's sad to be criticized unilaterally about household matters when we live together. As I approached him to retort, he glared at me with piercing eyes and clicked his tongue loudly. Did you really come here just to talk back? Such a pain. Your attitude is really not cute at all, and it's tiresome. Don't say things like that. What's gotten into you lately? Your words have been harsh. Are you that tired? He wasn't always like this. I wanted to believe that. I wanted to convince myself that he was just under a lot of stress from work and that was making him act out of character. Scott spat out. Yeah, that's right. It's because you're lounging around at home and not cute at all that I don't feel relaxed when I come home. That's not a fair thing to say. Cutting off my response, Scott continued to insult me. You might not realize it, but you're just too plain. Your makeup is sloppy, your clothes are dull. You're clumsy with men. You lack any charm as a woman. I married you thinking you'd at least be competent at work and household chores, but it's just boring to be with you. I felt as if I had been hit in the head with a huge rock. The impact made everything go dark for a moment, and then tears began to flow. This touched on my insecurities, things that Scott had helped me overcome during our relationship, and thus, were things I never wanted to hear from him. It was an irreparable wound to my heart. Suddenly, I remembered my younger sister asking everyone, who's cuter, me or my sister. The image of her doing so flashed through my mind. After that, 
Scott quickly finished his bath and went to bed without speaking a single word to me. He showed no signs of apologizing for what he said. As I finished up the remaining chores in the kitchen while crying, I desperately tried to figure out what went wrong. Why had things turned out this way? Why had Scott changed? Being busy and stressed is unavoidable. It's true that there might be flaws in my housework. However, what left a deep wound and continued to bother me was my husband Scott's comment that I was not cute. It made me remember how he would go out and have fun with my younger sister Lisa, who is attractive, and my mother Diane, who dresses youthfully. It was as if dots were being connected in my mind, leading to an answer. No way. Muttering softly, I involuntarily held my breath. Then, I sneaked into the room where my husband was sleeping and opened his bag. It was filled with what appeared to be work-related documents, but that wasn't what I was looking for. Illuminating the inside with my smartphone's light, I found it, a long strand of hair that could only belong to a woman. Next, a receipt from a hotel emerged as potentially damning evidence. Upon inspection, it wasn't just for my husband but also listed the names of my sister, my mother, and my sister's husband. So it's true, I whispered to myself. Claiming to be on a business trip, he had actually been away with those three. Even though I had anticipated as much, the revelation still pained me. Their joyous outings before were nothing like this deceitful betrayal. To treat me coldly at home, only to lie and meet with them, there had to be something more sinister at play. My heart pounded loudly, and my body trembled uncontrollably. Having discovered this much, there was no turning back. I finally reached for his smartphone by the pillow. After a few attempts with likely passwords, it unlocked. The messages in call logs naturally revealed numerous pleasant exchanges with my sister and mother. From a distance, I methodically photographed these screens with my phone. Peeking into the photo folder next, I was confronted by a series of embarrassing photos involving my husband with my sister, my mother, and my sister's husband, images so shameful it was hard to speak of. I was overcome with a sense of revulsion, surpassing shock. Struggling to keep hold of the phone, I captured these images on my own device as well. Feeling nauseous, I rushed back to the kitchen and vomited repeatedly. The photographs starkly depicted indecent acts between my relatives and my husband, undeniably far from normal. Had he not been asleep, I would have screamed in outrage. I cried silently, suppressing my voice as I vomited again and again. Where did it all go wrong? Was it wrong to introduce my sister to my husband? Did I choose the wrong partner, or was it my failure to address my sister's unchecked behavior? Frustration and despair muddled my thoughts further. My husband was the first person I truly loved. Despite being introverted and lacking confidence, he taught me the joy of being loved and the pleasure of relying on someone, believing he was my soulmate. Yet, the outcome was unbearably cruel. The happy life I thought we shared was all a lie. My rage towards my sister also surged. From a young age, she took everything from me, family affection, material things. Despite her cuteness and charm, and the way she was spoiled by our parents, I had always forgiven her. I thought her marriage and her doting husband had settled her down. But no more. This time, I cannot forgive. And my mother, too, was appalling. How could she engage in such acts with her daughter's husband and others? While I don't mind her dressing youthfully for her own satisfaction, I never imagined she could be so morally bankrupt. Is my mother still just a young girl, both in appearance and at heart? And she has a husband, my father. This is a betrayal to both me and my father. And my sister's husband, complacently participating in their acts, as if it was normal for his wife to engage with another man? Absurd. Everyone involved was utterly mad. I could have woken my husband to confront and berate him right then and there. However, 
part of me wondered if there might be a smarter way to handle this. Despite barely sleeping, I went to work the next day. At work, I found time to call the sales department where my husband, Scott, works and got connected to his manager. Pretending it was a work-related call, I began asking about the business trip Scott was supposed to be on. The manager sounded surprised and said, Business trip? Scott hasn't been on any business trip. He's been off for three days citing family issues, but it wasn't related to you, Tracy. The manager's words confirmed my suspicion that Scott was lying about his whereabouts. I played it off as a misunderstanding and hung up, only to call a certain someone later that night. Scott announced he would be going on another business trip for a few days, likely another lie for a family affair. I couldn't muster a smile. Instead, I saw him off with a stern look. By then, I had already identified a trustworthy lawyer, preparing for the next steps. In the evening, while at work, I received an unexpected call from an out-of-town general hospital. It was unusual to receive a direct call instead of through an app, especially from an unknown number, but I answered. The caller was from the hospital, informing me that a family member had been in an accident. I immediately got permission to leave work early and headed to the hospital. Upon arrival and after speaking with the reception, a nurse escorted me to a specific room. Opening the door, I was greeted with harsh words. You're late, caregiver. You're so slow and useless. I rushed over as soon as I could. What do you mean, caregiver? Feeling anger at his words, I retorted. Looking at my husband lying in the bed, his legs were encased in casts, hinting at the severity of the accident. It was clear even to a layperson that he wouldn't be able to walk on his own for a while. Yet, despite being battered and bruised, he was very much spirited, continuing to berate me. It's your fault for not being here sooner. You're the worst wife ever. Reflect on your actions. As he yelled, he threw a 16-ounce bottle filled with something at me. Ouch. The bottle hit my head before I could react, causing me pain and shock. Scott laughed mockingly at my discomfort. Serves you right. Look, I've seriously injured myself, so you better take good care of me from now on. Fuming and unable to move from where I had crouched, someone else entered the room, chiming in with a high-pitched voice. I'm counting on you to take care of me, and the kids too. Turning around, I saw my sister, Lisa, using crutches, smiling mischievously. Confused and furious about their entitlement, I confronted them. What on earth do you mean? Scott replied with a smug smile. Isn't it obvious? We're in this state now and can't return to work, so you've got to take care of us. Lisa added with a smirk. You'll be taking care of us and the kids from now on, big sis. Not knowing the full extent of what happened but seeing my sister-in-law and my own husband engaging in an affair, and then for both of them to so nonchalantly say such things was beyond belief. Something finally snapped in my head, and I stepped into the hospital room, yelling from the depths of my soul. How dare you say such things? Surprised by my outburst, they looked at me cluelessly. Who's been fooling around with her sister's husband, huh? Stop playing dumb. I've always let your selfishness slide, Lisa, but involving my husband crosses the line. What were you thinking? When I confronted my sister, she made a displeased face for a moment before brushing it off with a sweet tone, saying, what are you talking about? I don't get it. You're scary, sis. Besides, it's fine because the kids are always at Nick's parents' place anyway. Then, turning to my husband, she began to whine, E.W., I just don't like her. Ignore her. She's always been stubborn and no fun, nothing like you, Lisa. Really makes me wonder why I married her in the first place. Being referred to as her and treated like a common adversary by them both was more than I could bear, 
prompting me to address my husband next. Enough from you too. I've gathered enough evidence, so there's no escaping the truth. You've cheated with my sister, which is despicable. Infidelity is one thing, but this is a new low. Scary, aren't you? What evidence? We're victims here, and you're accusing us without a shred of sympathy. You're the worst. Facing my husband's mocking gaze, I confronted him with the evidence of his infidelity that I had captured on my smartphone. I felt guilty for suspecting you, but your behavior was too peculiar to ignore, so I did some digging. As a result, I know everything. Let me reiterate, both of you are truly despicable. It's revolting. Who do you think would care for people like you? After firmly stating my piece, I turned on my heel and left the hospital room. As I passed a stunned nurse, I gave a small nod before quickly making my way out, regretting the wasted time I could have spent elsewhere. As I hurried down the hospital corridor, a familiar voice called out my name from behind. Turning around, I was greeted by the sight of my mother in a wheelchair, looking much her age without makeup and with disheveled hair, an unusual sight for her. My mother looked somewhat uncomfortable, but like my husband and sister, she displayed no remorse. The person pushing her wheelchair caught my attention, it was my sister's husband. To think I'd run into not just my husband and sister, but these two as well. Recalling how I'd left in anger without hearing their side of the story, I approached them for an explanation. After a moment of awkward silence, they suggested we move to a quieter spot, and that's when my sister's husband began to speak. My mother, sister, husband, and sister's husband had taken time off to gather for a secretive getaway to an adults-only spot known for its heavy snow. Without proper preparation, they ventured into snowy mountain roads where their vehicle flipped on a steep slope, heavily injuring my husband and sister from the impact, and partially paralyzing my mother when the car struck a tree. My sister's husband, saved by the cushioning of a pillow he happened to bring, escaped with just a sprain. As he recounted their reckless adventure, his eyes dropped, filled with unease. No matter how regretful they might now seem, it was too late. Such irresponsible behavior, if discovered by the relatives caring for my sister's children, would surely not be overlooked lightly. Just then, my phone rang with a call from someone familiar. After taking the call, I requested a nurse to gather the four in one room. Upon arriving with my mother and brother-in-law at the hospital room where my bedridden husband and sister awaited, I revealed that I was fully aware of their deeds and had shared everything. I know exactly what you all have been doing. Of course, I do. And then. Saying that, I opened the door to the hospital room that had been closed. I've told him everything as well. Standing there was my father, his face contorted in anger and disappointment. Is everything Tracy told me true? He asked in a low, strained voice, looking at my mother and sister as if they were strangers. Yes, it's true. I have the evidence on my phone, some of which I can't show you. I replied, showing him what I could on my smartphone. As he saw each piece of evidence, his rage visibly intensified, shaking him to his core. You all. What disgraceful things have you been doing? To think I've been content with such a promiscuous woman as my wife all this time. As he moved directly toward my mother, he suddenly opened his bag and presented her with a divorce form. You've deceived me for so long. Infidelity with another man, and to think, both with our daughter's husband, that's just not right. Honestly, I'm ashamed to have had you as my wife. I wish I could start my life over. The intensity of my father's presence was immense, causing everyone in the room to hold their breath. My mother looked uneasy, casting her gaze around, and looked at my father with a flattering gaze. Oh, come on, you're being dramatic. It was just friendly outings with our daughter's husband. It's better to be on good terms than bad, right? 
Good family relations don't justify such behavior. He then showed Diane the embarrassing photos displayed on my smartphone, which I had shown him. Please, let's not talk about divorce. I admit what I did and I'll reflect on it. If we divorce, I'll have nowhere to live. And with my injuries. Please, forgive me. I couldn't care less. Despite my mother's attempts to excuse herself, my father forced a pen into her hand. He already knew from me about her paralysis. He already knew that my mother couldn't escape. If you understood what you've done, you wouldn't dare make such excuses. Don't act so entitled. You brought this upon yourself. Stop it. I don't want this. After a brief struggle, my father overpowered my mother and forced her to sign the divorce paper. Simultaneously, I presented Scott with the divorce papers I had prepared since the day I found evidence in his room. What's this now? You called yourself a caregiver. To my ludicrous husband, I replied. I said I won't take care of you. Haven't you realized what you've done yet? Just like I showed Dad, all the evidence is saved. You're despicable. Snooping through my stuff. You're the vulgar one, not me, he retorted, losing his temper. I was utterly dismayed by his reaction. Don't say anything more absurd. I never want anything to do with such low-life individuals again. Once this divorce paper is filed, I'll leave the house immediately. And since this is a grave misconduct, I'll be seeking compensation. From you, Lisa, as well. Lisa grimaced deeply at the mention of compensation, a discussion already underway with my lawyer. The official amount will likely be determined soon. Lisa's husband, who had been a passive observer, now appeared relieved, thinking he was out of the woods regarding divorce or compensation. He was complicit in the domestic affair, making him equally guilty in my eyes. I turned to him and stated plainly, you seem to enjoy dragging us into your fun. From now on, their care and responsibilities fall on you. Hearing this, his relaxed demeanor vanished and his face turned pale. Also, I've recorded this entire conversation in the room. Should anything arise, it'll serve as evidence. Thank you. With that final cold remark, I left the room, followed closely by my father. Without speaking, my father and I walked together to the station, overwhelmed with a mix of regret and sadness. Left in the hospital were four morally bankrupt individuals, now burdened with injuries, compensation, and caregiving responsibilities as supposed to be. I promptly filed the divorce papers and moved out of the apartment I shared with my ex-husband. After staying with friends for a while, I started moving on with my life. Upon explaining my situation to my company within a reasonable scope, I was transferred to a better location due to my reliable work history and trustworthiness. I quickly adapted to my new job, earning the trust and making friends, enjoying my weekends and holidays once again. Since the accident up until now, my life has improved significantly as if the difficult days after getting married were a lie. I've been in touch with my father a bit since we parted ways in silence that day. After filing for divorce from my mother, he returned to his single assignment location and seems to be working there as usual. It appears my mother reached out to him about medical expenses and living costs, but each time, he firmly refused to engage with her, saying he wouldn't deal with her anymore. At one point, my mother even contacted his workplace begging for money. At his limit, my father threatened, if you keep harassing me, I'll sue you for adultery damages. Fearing further debt, my mother ceased contact thereafter. My ex-husband Scott ended up returning to his parents' house until his injuries healed. However, since I had sent the compensation claim to his parents' house, anticipating this, the whole story of the injury came out, and needless to say, his parents were furious. Once healed, Scott was disowned and kicked out of the house. 
Burdened with the repayment of compensation, he rented a cheap apartment and tried to return to work, but faced continuous scorn at his workplace due to the domestic infidelity scandal, eventually leading to his resignation. Effectively, it was as if he was fired. Since then, despite ongoing job searches, he hasn't found stable employment and has been covering his living expenses and compensation payments through a low-paying warehouse job. As for Lisa and her husband and their children, the conclusion was that Lisa lost custody of her children to her in-laws. The claim for compensation exposed their actions to her husband's family, who, deeply contemptuous of them, decided they couldn't entrust the children to Lisa. Lisa's husband was also disowned by his family, and they had to earn for the children's support, my mother's medical expenses, and their living costs alone. Lisa's husband, once a bartender, left his job as the incident became a rumor among the customers and shop. He's been hopping between similar jobs since, but the small world of alcohol lovers means he's met with cold stares wherever he goes, making any long-term employment untenable. Lisa, having never worked before, started from scratch with a job at a local supermarket, facing many hardships. Moreover, Diane's once bright demeanor vanished due to her physical limitations, turning her constantly irritable and demanding. Facing daily outbursts from my mother, Lisa lost her once cheerful and charming nature, becoming gaunt and gloomy. Thankfully, having distanced myself from such chaos, I thrived in my new job. A year later, I began dating a man I met there. Though initially cautious about love after the shock with Scott, our relationship grew from a deep-seated friendship and trust. I decided to learn from my past, realizing staying passive wouldn't do. Waiting for someone to break through my shell would only make me vulnerable to people like Scott. Happiness must be seized with courage. Would you consider dating me with marriage in mind? Taking the first step, I confessed to him. Surprised and bashful, he accepted my proposal. Your confession made me incredibly happy, but I feel somewhat inadequate. I'll strive to be a better man. He said with a shy smile. Don't worry about it. I made my decision, and you're enough as you are. Let's look forward to our future together. Our relationship flourished, and a year later, we joyfully decided to get married. The understanding and acceptance from him and his family about not inviting mine to the wedding or celebration were comforting. A new life begins in a place where I feel secure and comfortable, alongside someone precious with whom I'll build our future.